Well, good morning. Good morning. It's great, great to be in the house of the Lord. Well, today, before we get started, um, the message I have prepared for you uh, for giving is in Proverbs 3, in its verse 9. Honor the Lord with your wealth and with the best part of everything that you produce. Interesting, I haven't had this thought in a long time, but uh, this morning I, rem- I was reminded of my age. I'm 39 years old today. True story. Yeah, it's a true story. Actually, um, 39 years ago, I uh, had a boat accident and should have died in that accident. It was Coast Guard Festival weekend and accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. So 39 years ago, I was born again, accepted Jesus as my Lord and Savior. So, amen. So, um, I am so thankful for how God is so great and so awesome. He's so good, and he desires to do a work inside of our life. Well, after I got saved, um, I began to realize that my heart changed. He gave me a new heart, and my desires changed, and my thoughts changed, and my impressions changed. And the next thing I know, I had this desire to give. And I remember working at Steelcase. Um, I was there for quite a few years. And we would get these quarterly bonuses and year in bonuses. And they were quite large, um, at least at the time they were. And I would pray for them. I would pray that, pray that we would get large bonuses, not for myself, because I wanted to give. I wanted to, I said, God, I, I want to give my first fruit. I couldn't wait to receive that bonus so that I could give to the Lord. The Bible says, honor the Lord with your first fruit. And the same thing, I couldn't wait to get my tax return and stuff because I wanted to give. That's my passion because what happens is, and all of a sudden you realize that, you know, that God changes lives and God changes. He wants to work through your life to touch another life. You know, the, the, the saddest thing is when we believe the lie that your life doesn't make a difference. When you believe that your giving doesn't make a difference, when you believe you're serving doesn't make a difference when you believe that uh, um, all of the you know your uh, worship doesn't make a difference when you believe those lies you start believing thinking that you're insignificant and exactly the exact opposite of what God would say of you that God says you are significant in fact we're going to talk about that today in the message so we have four different ways that you can give because there's so many different things whether it's you know you want to give online whether you want to give um, through text to give, whether you want to give in the mailbox. Um, there's just many different ways that we do that so that we make it convenient because so many of us with our cash and the way we interact with our, our, our money today is so unique. So we just want to make it so you understand that your heart needs to be in a heart to give. It's a form of worship. Well, Father, thank you for the opportunity to do just that. And Lord, I, I, I sense that there's somebody in this, in this room that wants to start to give. And they just feel like, I, I, I just don't have it, Pastor Ron. I'm just not in that place. And God would say to you that you start out small. You just start and the Lord will begin to bring his river. Just like a, a, a waterway will start out small. And next thing you know, what starts out from the top of the mountain is a small little trickle of melt. Turns into a raging river down below. That's what God wants to do in bringing your life. But all you need to do is obey the little, and God will bring his plan and unfold it in the chapters of your life to come. God, we thank you, Lord, for that. Even that promise right now, even interrupting the service. God, I pray that you touch that heart right now. In Jesus' name. All God's people said, amen. In Numbers chapter 16, today we're going to be talking about a, uh, a character, and we're going to go also into the book of Jude. Um, and, you know, in the book of Jude, he's brother of Jesus, and there's only one chapter that's referred to in the book of Jude. And uh, in the side of that chapter, a lot of it's given toward people that really struggle with authority. And, you know, we live in a generation, we live in a culture right now that is anti-authority. Um, and yet, you know, when you get one day... When we are captured and we uh, have that day in heaven that all of us uh, that love the Lord want to be, you know one of the first things you're going to recognize when you get there is order and authority. You're going to be in awe of it. 
because you're going to see angels that have different authorities and different spaces. You're going to see uh, saints that have different, uh, you know, objectives and directives from God, but all follow authority. There's going to be so much order and there's going to be so much authority. What you won't find ever a moment in heaven is chaos. Never will there be. And the reason that is, is because there's authority. Wherever there is authority, it dispels chaos. And so what we're going to talk about today is complaining. Um, We're going to talk about how in church people, God's people can get caught up in this. There's three characters we're going to talk about for the next couple weeks. Um, Korah, which we're going to talk about today. Cain, and then we're also going to talk about Balaam. Every, all three of these men had one thing in common. They were close to God. They were close to God. They talked to God. Many of them had high spaces and directives in God and with God, and yet they were misled because they followed the impressions, they followed the desire, their, their earthly desires inside of them. Every one of us, including myself, you do, we have earthly desires. We have, you know, and then we also, when we're born again, we have heavenly desires. I have a 39-year-old here, and then I also have a 62-year-old inside. And my 62-year-old says, I got seniority on you, 39-year-old. I want my ways. Okay? And yet I have to tell the 62-year-old, no, you need to follow the 39-year-old, the born-again one. You need to follow the unctions. You need to follow the Word of God. You need to follow the Holy Spirit. You need to follow services. You need to get, you know what, you need to understand that those little, that still quiet voice, not the noise and the rattle and the chaos that's all around you, that's easier to follow. And not only that, but it's in your physical nature to follow it. We'll find out about that's what Korah did. You know, and Korah is a person who was in leadership. And so let's um, start with Numbers chapter 16. Verse 1, one day Korah, son of Ishar, a descendant of Kohath, the son of Levi, conspired with Dathan and Abiram, the sons of Eliab, and On, the son of Pleth, from the tribe of Reuben. They incited a rebellion against Moses, along with 250 other leaders of the community, all prominent members of the assembly. So these are all leaders in the community. They united against Moses and Aaron and said, you've gone too far. The whole community of Israel has been set apart by the Lord, and he is with all of us. What right do you have to act as though you are greater than the rest of the Lord's people? Then Moses heard what they were saying. He fell face down on the ground. Then he said to Korah and his followers, Tomorrow morning the Lord will show who belongs to him and who is holy. The Lord will allow only those whom he selects to enter his own presence. Korah, you and all your followers must prepare your incense burners, light fires in them tomorrow, and burn incense before the Lord. Then we'll see whom the Lord chooses as his holy ones. You Levites are the ones who have gone too far. Then Moses spoke again to Korah. Now listen, you Levites, does it seem insignificant? to you that the God of Israel has chosen you from among the community of Israel to be near him so you can serve the Lord's tabernacle and stand before the people to minister to them. Korah, he has already given this special ministry to you and your fellow Levites. Are you demanding the priesthood as well? The Lord is the one who you and your followers are really revolting against. For who is Aaron that you are complaining about him? Then Moses summoned Dathan and Abiram, the sons of Eliab, but they replied, We refuse to come before you. Isn't it enough that you brought us out of Egypt in a land flowing with milk and honey to kill us here in the wilderness and that you now treat us like your subjects? By the way, God had promised them that he's going to bring them to a land that's flowing with milk and honey. Now they're saying you took us from a country that had milk and honey. What more? You haven't brought us into another land with milk and honey. You haven't given us a new homeland with fields and vineyards. Are you trying to fool these men? We will not come. Then Moses became angry and said to the Lord, Do not accept their grain offerings. I have not taken so much as a donkey from them. I have never heard or a single one of them. And Moses said to Korah, You and all your fathers must come here tomorrow and present yourselves before the Lord. Aaron will also be here. You and each of your 250 followers must prepare an incense burner and put incense on it so you can also present them before the Lord. Aaron will also bring his incense burner. So each of these men prepared an incense burner 
lit the fire, placed it incense in it. Then they all stood at the entrance of the tabernacle with Moses and Aaron. Meanwhile, Korah had stirred up the entire community against Moses and Aaron. They all together at the tabernacle entrance. Then the glorious presence of the Lord appeared to the whole community. And the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, Get away from all these people so that I may instantly destroy them. But Moses and Aaron fell face down on the ground. Oh God, they pleaded with you. They pleaded, You are the God who gives breath to all creatures. Must you be angry with all the people with only one man's sins? And the Lord said to Moses, Then tell all the people to get away from the tents of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram, and Aaron. And Aaron uh, and Abiram. So Moses got up, rushed over to the tents of Dathan and Abiram, followed by the elders of Israel. Quick, he told the people, get away from the tents of these wicked men and don't touch anything that belongs to them. If you do, you'll be destroyed for their sin. So all the people stood back from the tents of Korah, Dathan and Abiram. Then Dathan and Abiram came out and stood at the entrances of the tents, together with their wives and children and their little ones. And Moses said, this is how you'll know that the Lord has sent me to do all these things that I have done. For I have not done them on my own. If these men die a natural death, or if nothing unusual happens, then the Lord has not sent me. But if the Lord does something entirely new, and the ground opens its mouth and swallows them up and all their belongings, and they, do, and they go down alive into the grave, then you'll know that these men have shown contempt for the Lord. He had hardly finished speaking the words when the ground suddenly split Opened beneath them, the earth opened its mouth and swallowed the men along with their households and all the followers who were with, standing with them, and everything they owned. So they went down alive into the grave, and along with all their belongings, the earth closed over them, and they all vanished from among the people of Israel. All the people around them fled when they heard their screams. The earth swallowed us too, they cried. Now I want to turn to the book of Jude, one chapter. And I have, and I'm just going to kind of give you, a, I feel like sometimes the, the word talks in allegorical, analytical, you know, allegorical form. And what I mean by that is this, is I have seen people that have been swallowed up in complaining. I, found, I have found that where someone would find something that was a wrong to them. Maybe it was a worker, a co-worker. Maybe it was a friend. Maybe it was a pastor. Maybe it was a, you know, something that happened. It, it can be as, as um, minute as someone in a, a driving their car down the road, and, and all of a sudden a complaint <coughs> literally grabs hold of them and becomes consuming. It literally consumes their life, swallowed up in it. I think it's very um, ironic that we find that Korah started out with just a complaint, and he got swallowed up in the space of not seeing the destiny, the plan, and even, the, you know, even what God had given to him that was so important that he should honor and follow. Jude chapter 1, starting with verse 10, says this. These people scoff at things they do not understand. Like unthinking animals, they do whatever their instincts tell them. And so they bring about all their own destructions. What sorrow awaits them, for they follow the footsteps of Cain, who killed his brother. Like Balaam, they deceive people for money, and like Korah, they perish in their rebellion. So now I want to take a little bit of time and describe, you know, kind of get you in this, the history lesson of who Korah is. And many of us make excuses, we, make, we have reasons, uh, whatever they are, for our complaints. And let me show you something. I believe that God will bring scenarios in your life. You, God, chosen child, God will bring situational moments in your life to test you. To see if your heart will remain true in an unfair treated situation. God wants to know that. Well, there's a reason why that. We'll get to that in just a minute. But the point of it is, is that God wants to know that you'll never complain. In fact, I, I got a, a message, and I love Philippians chapter 2. You know, it talks about do nothing by murmuring and complaining. I remember the first time God showed me this passage was after another passage I had read about Jesus, is there was no guile in him. And I went, I read that again. I went, yeah, I can't do that. That's exactly what I said. I can't do that. And God goes, you can do all things through me that strengthens you. Oh, yeah, that. <laughs> and I realized, like, 
this, remember we just read it in Jude 1? Like brute beast, they follow their own instincts. See, I, sometimes I follow my own instincts, my human instinct. And it leads me into a place that I look like a brute beast. And it's important we realize that I cannot, God's going, look, I'm going to put tests that will come in your path where you'll instinctively want to do this. And you need to not follow that instinct. You need to follow the Holy Spirit. You need to, re- in fact, you're going to have to go almost 180 and go the exact opposite direction. And God wants to know that you'll do that in his strength. God wants to know that you'll do that with his spirit. That you'll resist your physical instincts to follow the spirit of God on the inside of you. Now Korah, as we kind of read, kind of had a high position. In fact, a little bit about him. He was the grandson of Kohath. A Kohathite, a Korah, was one of those responsible for transporting the items of the tabernacle. Now, if you know anything about the Old Testament, the tabernacle represented the presence of God. So these, these gentlemen were, were, were the ones that carried the space that represented the presence of God, including the ark. They were meant to take this place, and what happened was it no longer was enough for them. They complained. Now, I want you to be as honest as I'm going to try to be an honest. How many of you have ever complained about someone who got a promotion or someone who got, um, you, you, you know, something, just a, a fair deal or, or something that happened to somebody else that you figure you deserved more than they did or you just got some unfair treatment in your life? How many of you in this audience right now, with me included, have had that experience and you got frustrated? All right, I'm in a good... I'm with a bunch of sinners just like myself. All right. So those moments God allows in your path of your life so that you'll resist that crazy physical human instinct to make things right on your own, to be a judge. In fact, did you know that one day, you're, you know, in fact, before I get to that, I'll do this in the first service. How many of you have ever had the desire to judge something? Okay. The Bible says that Jesus says, I didn't come here to judge. So you, under authority, do not have the right to judge. Authority tells you So when you judge, what you're really doing is you're defying the authority of God's word, is what you're doing. But one day, the Bible says, you'll judge angels. I mean, that's the authority that God's going to give his saints, but not now. So God wants to know that that you're not trying to live in your tomorrows. And some of us want our promises. And this is what was happening with Korah. He goes, I want it now. And don't raise your hand if that's ever happened to you. Because we all have. That's in our culture. It's in our instinct to want something now. Just talk to, um, read even after service today. There's a young man that just went through a heartfelt broke up with a girlfriend, you know, for two and a half years. And God had a word for him. I had no idea what was going on. And I just said, you know what? God's going to do something new. you got to let go of the old. And he just started, he's going over because he knew what God wanted him to do. But he doesn't want to do it. Don't raise your hand because I know that's a lot of us. Amen? We don't want to do it. And so he goes, so what happens? He goes, well, how do I do that? I says, you don't do it in your own strength. You do it in his strength. And yet, it's, doesn't it, it's, it's a lot easier to say that, isn't it? Because when your ima- emotions are raging, when you're brokenhearted, and you're going through all of your physical spirit of rejection is in your head, what should I have said? What could I have done different? And all of the things, and possibly those are all true. But what happens now is the spirit gets inside of your instinct and makes you stink. The demons live in the instinctual behaviors of our lives. They, They follow you around and see what your instinct to do is. Oh, this is how you handle rejection? Or this is how you handle a bitter situation. This is how you handle something unfair. This is how you handle when somebody steals something from you. This is how you handle when the teacher gives you a grade you don't feel. When, you know, when all of a sudden you have an essay 
and all of a sudden they go over there and they cut your essay apart and you put your heart, all they're doing is spelling corrections instead of looking at the what heart. You're sitting there going, well, if, what, why didn't they measure the words and not the spelling? That's those tests that go on in your life. And the devil sees all of that and wants to get inside of your instinct and make your life stink. Or what you can do is just say, God, I surrender. My 39-year-old knows how to handle that inside of me, those situations. The 62-year-old wants to have its way. And you know, and then, and then I, you know what's really sad is, the sad part is in the church situation. Because in the church situation, we always look and we measure ourselves. See, all of us, you ladies, I watch you guys, you measure each other, you're looking at each other, how someone looks, and you know, what kind of hair they are, what kind of shoes they are. I mean, y'all do it, us guys do the same thing. What kind of truck we have, what kind of, you know, what kind of hobbies we do, and what kind of ladies by our side. We, we do all, it's all the measuring stuff. And so what we do in the church, we do it spiritually too. It's an unsaid thing that's said. And so we're measuring ourselves. Well, we're looking around and go, I'm not as bad as that one. And so I must be okay. When God's going, I'm working on your heart to change you, why does that have anything to do with you? I'm working on you. But what happens is your instinct goes, well, I want things my own way. You're like, you know, we're like, like children. And the Bible says, I love it when God says, put away your childish ways. Man, my, my 62 year old wants to still act like a child. My 39 year old inside of me wants to grow up and be everything God wants me to be. Number one, those who are in authority are judged more harshly. So, you know, I look at um, Korah, he, he didn't understand God's word. If he would have understood God's word more, he goes, Man, I don't want Moses' position. I don't want that. You know what, to be honest with you, um, there's many times I've had to. You know, discussion. I don't, I, don't, I don't want this position, God. I get, look at James chapter 3, verse 1. Dear brothers and sisters, not many of you should become teachers in the church. For he who teaches will be judged more strictly. The rules are harder on me than they're going to be on you. Yeah, I don't want that. I want nothing to do with that. And so I, I would say, God, I, whatever I do, do it unto you and for you. Number two, Korah is jealous of those who are higher up in authority. People get jealous and they want, we are a people that we're taught from when we're children of positional importance and acceptance. We're in the playground and all of a sudden we're playing with all of our peers and all of a sudden we didn't get picked. We're learning positional acceptance from the minute, all of a sudden, one kid, we're not as good as the sports. We're not as good as, maybe we're not as good at, at conversing. Maybe we're not as good at talking or whatever. We're learning situational acceptance already in the playground. And God has no such thing as situational acceptance. You are chosen. You are peculiar. You are important. You are authentic. You are his kid just the way you are. And when you're trying to be something you're not, God's going... Well, no wonder you're frustrated. You're not even who I called you to be. Numbers chapter 16, we fight it, uh, find that Korah is so frustrated, all he can, instead of being thankful for the honor to carry the presence of God's utensils, all he can think on right now is, I want what Moses has. I can do better than what Moses did. And by the way, unless we get you know, uh, too crazy on that. Look at point number three. Korah uses influence to me manipulate others to sway his way in rebellion. I have watched church splits. I've watched people, you know, people use their influence to, to have people leave this church. That's rebellious. If God calls you a different church, that's okay. But don't do it to manipulate others to follow what you're doing. If God calls others, that, that's God. But I've seen this happen over and over and over again. It's not of the right spirit. And this is what I'm trying to say. This happens in church. I'm not, all these things I'm sharing with aren't even what I'm talking about in the world. This is the church world that we're talking. Korah was, you could say he's, he's a church leader. He's high up in the church leadership role. Number four, 
Rebellion is of an evil spirit, and we must resist it. Um, there's a great uh, teaching on d- the demonic in deliverance, and I know that um, we're, we're really trying to move a lot more uh, forward in our directive as far as deliverance ministry here, and, and uh, it's just, it just wasn't taught to me. Um, it's not really uh, handed down, and it's almost unheard of in the church today, uh, but if it's in the Word of God, then it's something we're supposed to do. Amen? And so we're just stepping in. We're making mistakes. We're doing the best that we know how to do. But we're going to take our, you know, we're going to walk by faith and not by sight. And so what we're finding is that, that the Spirit wants to jump in the space, my, myself included. That I can't just, well, that's a bad behavior. Well, my bad behaviors, next thing you know, start leading into all of a sudden creating a, a, an environment where God's not lifted up. The enemy's lifted up. I need to be delivered from that activity in my life. And I'm not going to blame the devil because what happens is, is that my own instinct, my own desires in my life, Satan follows and goes, huh, that's not surrendered to God yet. I'm going to work in that one to destroy him. So that's why we have this altar designed to surrender. Because anything that you don't surrender is still the instinct in your life. I am so thankful I was watching, you know, I, I got to watch my um, grandkids a lot and my kids uh, this week, uh, being that one of my Jake's on vacation, so we're taking care of a couple of the grandkids and stuff. And I was so grateful to see that some of the things that were in my instinct, things that were in my life, my, my kids don't, they're not doing. And I remember when I was... Uh, I remember when I was younger and uh, was at Resurrection Life in Grand Haven, and God spoke to me, says, the things that you don't overcome, your kids will have to overcome. So when God was telling me, hey, stop being a jerk as a father, it's more than that. My sons are going to have to fight being jerks for fathers if I don't win and overcome. Some of you struggle with your, you know, with your finances and succumbing to your finances. Some of you struggle with your health. Some of you struggle with your attitudes. Some of you struggle when it comes down to your marital vows. And some of you struggle, I mean, all these different things. Whatever you don't overcome, blessed is he who overcomes. And so God's not asking you to, to get it all right in one step. In fact, it's the path of righteousness. But what's in front of you and he's talking to you about? Win with God. So that you're, so not only you have a testimony, but now your children, they'll have to fight different things, but they won't have to fight the thing you overcame, amen? I want my kids to win at home. And so when the demons that are following me from generations back, I want to overcome them. 1 Samuel 15, 23 says this, Rebellion is as serious as the sin of divination, a fortune teller. Now, if... I, I'm assuming that you know fortune telling is evil. It's wrong. And so if you didn't know what it is, okay, you're leaning into the devil and you're leaning into the paths of the enemy to try to get a future, okay? Well, most of you probably know what fortune is telling is wrong. And so you'd say, you'd tell the fortune teller, look, you're not welcome here. You, I mean, you need Jesus. You can't, you can't give that to my husband. You can't give that to my kids. You can't give that to my wife. You know, you're not, well, this is, this work, this Evil work is not welcome here. But when your four-year-old goes through Walmart and pitches a fit because they can't have a ten, you know, a, a one-dollar candy bar, the Bible says that's just like fortune telling. There's pitching a fit of rebellion. Well, that's a little different. No, it's not. It's the same spirit. Maybe it's a different activity. But it's the same spirit. And that four-year-old is learning how to manipulate, learning how to, goes, let's see. They may not even count it because it's just their instinct to want the candy bar. But uh, the enemy behind is going, you know what? Five cries in a scream gets the candy bar every time. I'm preaching. And I hope you guys are hitting home, all right? It's the spirit of rebellion. And disobedience is as serious as false religion in idolatry. Isaiah chapter 30 says this, What sorrow awaits my rebellious children, says the Lord. You make plans that are contrary to mine. You make alliances that are not directed by my spirit. 
thus piling up, piling up your sins. James chapter 3, verse 14 and 16, amplified. But if you have bitterness, jealousy, and selfish ambition in your heart. I remember when I was looking for a promotion at Steelcase. Selfish ambition in my heart. I remember when I desired, I said, I'm going to start this boat business, you know, 30 some years ago. I'm going to do this. I was selfish in my own heart. Do not be arrogant and as a result be in defiance of the truth. This superficial wisdom is not that which comes down from above, is earthly, secular, natural, unspiritual, even, what does it say? Demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exists, there is disorder, unrest, and rebellion, and every evil thing and morally degrading practice. Tell me that we don't live in a world of bitterness and envy and selfish ambition. That's our world, amen? That's the world. We, your workplace is like that. Your home at times can be like that. Your neighborhood can be like that. That, that is literally the world in which we live, and the spirits of darkness are living inside of those instincts to create chaos around us, and it, we, got, we need to be wise enough not to follow their impressions, follow their instincts. Now, something as I was studying this, because this is what I love about the Bible, when you study it, you get a lot more because, you know, Korah getting swallowed up and, you know, this whole family getting swallowed up in the whole situation. And you look at that and go, man, that's, that's, that's big, God. And then you study it out and you go, four chapters, four chapters, within a, about a year's time, Korah had a whole lot of warnings. You know, I believe that God is, before any kind of detriment or any kind of uh, consequence comes in your life, God has been talking to you. He has been talking. He's been speaking. He's, been, had, he's had other people. In fact, I, I like Henry Blackaby. Um, great study book, by the way, Experiencing God. And he talks about how God wants to talk to all of us. And then after God's trying to bring his word, you know, talk to us through his word, he's trying to talk to us through a voice, a dream, or, or such. And then, and then if you were still not listening, because some of us don't want to hear what he has to say, then he'll bring somebody in your path. He'll talk to you through somebody in your path. Maybe it's a pastor. Maybe it's an elder. Maybe it's a friend. Maybe it's a spouse. Maybe it's your brother or sister in Christ or whatever. He'll bring somebody in your path and right out, and it brings that impression that you're supposed to follow. And, and, you're, and then you're still not following it. And then God goes, all right, fine. The only way we can learn is through obedience and disobedience. He'll bring the hard lesson. Well, chapter 12 Miriam, most of you probably know who Miriam is. It's Aaron's old, or uh, it's, I'm sorry, it's Moses' older sister. And Miriam is, you know, she defies, in chapter 12, she defies because Moses marries, in her eyes, the wrong woman, Zipporah. And so he, she gets out of authority. Now, how many of you realize in the Bible, God resists the pecking order all the time? On purpose. Because in every one of us, in our instinct, is the older gets to tell the younger what to do. Don't tell me this. I'm the oldest. My wife is the oldest. Oh, my goodness. Punk, punk, punk. We're pecking now. You know, who's the pecking order? You know, what happens is that when you have that oldest thing going on inside of you, you ain't letting nobody younger, no younger sibling telling you what to do. Oh, that ain't happening. So why does it God that chooses Joseph, David, he does this on purpose because what he's doing is you can't follow your instinct. you got to follow the Spirit of God that's on the person. But yet we do it all the time. We put the pecking order. Here's Miriam and Aaron put the pecking order in front of what God is saying and what to do. And she becomes leprous. So just to say Korah saw that. He saw what happens when you defy authority. But he didn't listen. Numbers chapter 14, a couple chapters later, we find that the 12 spies are sent out to the promised land. Ten of them come back. Yeah, it's just exactly what God said, but we're like grasshoppers. All of a sudden, they, began, they got a wrong impression 
kind of like what Korah. So they, they knew. And these ten spies, there was heavy judgment. You can read it. Numbers chapter 14. For not believing what God had said. And they were, again, the leaders. And so you know that Korah had an intimate relationship, an intimate understanding of what happened to Miriam and what also happened to these ten spies. And then when you jump to Numbers chapter 15, God tells everybody, he goes, well, because of what's the 12, you know, the 10 spies and all of the followers of God didn't want to believe, we're going to be in the wilderness for 40 years. So you would think, now we're up to chapter 16. How many lessons do you need, Korah, to realize you need to follow authority even if you don't agree with it? Because in the space of this is a test. It's a test of your heart. I'm not saying that, that Moses marrying Zipporah was the right thing. I'm not saying that the ten spies came back with a lie because they didn't. They said the truth, but their heart attitude wasn't right. God is looking at your heart in the space of your test. Will you follow him? And God will bring tests in your life that are unfair unjust, and that you need to trust God. He'll bring leaders in your life that won't do it as good as you properly or have the wisdom that you do. He'll put leaders in front of you that would even properly do it, maybe even wrong, and you need to trust God, not necessarily what's happening to you. But see, that's what happens, isn't it? It happens all the time. People don't follow authority. And that's the test. Number five, we will be tested in our lives for rebellion. You'll be tested for how you honor your parents, the laws of the land, the laws of God, your service of God, your giving to God, the authority of God. These are all the things that God will bring in the space of your life. And what I love about God is God includes so many men and women in the Word that got a lot of things right and had some big things wrong. In Psalms 139, in fact, if you could put that scripture up there, man, search me, O God, and know me. And, you know, we've been going through this cleansing, and we're trying to help you understand that this is not something that is your pastor's job or your church's space or authority. This is something between you and God. And David is a man who, the Bible says, is a man after God's own heart. And yet in his, stink, in his instinct, he's a human. And Satan sees that. I don't know, you know, you could sit there and, and I remember listening to, I was, in a, I was actually part of a, um, a panel of, of pastors. And this, this sister in Christ, she just asked the coolest question. She goes, she goes Pastor Ron... What was wrong in the Old Testament? Why did these guys get to have all these wives? And what, what is up with all that? And God allowed things, didn't desire things. Just kind of like a lot of times with us. He allows things in us, but doesn't desire that. It's no different than the Old Testament. So here's David, who is struggling and he sees a beautiful woman on top of the, you know, basically on top of the house. Another thing, and he sees, so she's in his eyesight. And he lusts for her. He follows his instinct. Some of you men, or even ladies today, it's porn. You might say that, sir, an introduction to the Bible has got a porn page right there in, in chapter and verse. Here is David looking on a naked woman. That's porn, amen? And so what are we supposed to do with it? He should have left that view, just like maybe you got it on your phone or whatever. Leave that view. Turn, turn your phone off. Do whatever you got to do, but get out of that space. Because what happens next is dumber. Okay? And then he follows that instinct, brings her in to his, basically his chambers, and they, ha and, and they basically, and by the way, this is one of David's heroes, fighters. 
This is also the granddaughter of his wise counsel. He knew her. And she knew him. Both of them wrong. Bottom line is, is something was missing inside of them. And how many times do we feel like, well, something's missing in our life? And we, and, and we take things in our own hands. Instead of letting God and his timing bring it, we just take it for ourselves. It never ends good. And so it didn't. And the next thing we know, we see David. But here's the thing that I love about what God says about David. David didn't blame Bathsheba. He didn't blame, um, you know, his ex-wives or his wives he had. He didn't blame, you know, and what he did is he blamed himself. He took ownership of his own sin. And then what I really love about it is that he goes, you know, what, God, this helps me see that I didn't even see this coming in my own life. So search me, oh God, and see if there be anything else. I'm sure there is. Try me of any wicked thing. And this is what cleansing is all about. In church, sometimes we're looking at everybody else and going, well, we're trying to help everybody else with their problem. I do. I, try, I help a lot of people in their spiritual problems. But I, I hope I don't come across like I don't have my own. I have my own. And I want to give them to God. Some of you are here today, and maybe you're, well, you know, I'm trying to help my spouse and my wife, or maybe I'm helping my kid, or maybe I'm helping so-and-so who lives in my home, or saying, I'm, I'm up, you know, I'm just going to share with something. Let God search you. The greatest thing that you can ever have in your walk with God is you and God go for a walk and God begins to cleanse you on the inside and you find the honor to say, God, I'm sorry. I'm sorry for that motivation. I'm sorry for that thought. I'm sorry for taking, you know what, looking at that page. God, I, I'm sorry for giving it a second thought. I'm sorry, Father, for allowing my emotions to get, get wrapped up in rejection. I am sorry, God, for beginning to, you know what, need a man more than I need you, God, or need a woman more than I need you, God. I'm sorry, God. S teach me your ways. Show me your path. Soon I'm going to be able to relate to you something. God gave me a vision this week. I don't even have a full, I have no full understanding of it, but it was, it was called the path of righteousness. And I find that, that every one of us are on a path, or we're supposed to be. And God, it wanting, he's wanting us, and he allows us to be included with his plan to be part of getting rid of the chaos and clutter. And then the path becomes clearer and, and sharper and more accurate in his ways. And then not only do we see that path, but others around us see the path of righteousness that God has in our life. His testimony unfolds. And so many times I'm seeing that we're just, what did Korah do? Well, what are you doing with him, Moses? Remember, remember Peter doing? What are you going to do with John? It's in our nature to be jealous. It's in our nature to think that something's unfair. And I believe that God wants us in those moments because in those moments, your heart could never be more pure when things are terrible and they're stinky and they're unfair. And you go, God, here's my heart. I stay true to you. I will stay true to you no matter what things I'm living and breathing in. That's purity of heart. And God goes, on that one, Isaiah 66, on that broken and contrite heart, I would truly manifest myself in. Father, I'm so grateful for truth. And even many times that truth smacks me right in the head, God. I'm grateful for those smacks even, Lord. God, your word tells us that you discipline those whom you love. So, Lord, here we are. Here we are, God. Search us, oh God. And know us. See if there be any way, God, in our path with you that's cluttered. I know there is, God, in all of us. Father, may you open up our eyes to see it. 
May we recognize, maybe there's a a yearning, maybe there's a hurt, maybe there's a a space of frustration, maybe there's a, a a vengeful, vindictive, whatever it is, God. God, I pray that that thing be removed and as a child, we can come to you and say, here we are, God, all yours. To you we surrender. Today, as you take communion, the Spirit of God would say that the blood of Christ would take care of anything that's caused unrest or chaos in your past. It'll forgive you and cleanse you. Anything that's trying to grab hold of you, pull you back into that hurt or pull you back into your sin, pull you back into chaos. The blood of Jesus Christ will break that cord. And then the body, Jesus that broke, is literally the food that will feed your spirit man to step in to newness, to step in to his path. So as you take communion today, allow the blood, the juice that represents the blood of Christ to cut away everything in your past and present. And allow the body to feed your inner man. He was broken so that you could have newness of life. Let's stand up and let's worship our King.